This episode is scripted by John Ruths and Newell Fisher and is narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 53 in which we will be looking at the epilogue and therefore the last chapter of the 1972 novel. And before we continue, can I just reassure you that we will be back next week and the week after that. This podcast is going nowhere. Epilogue There are two pre-chapter quotes for this final chapter. The first is a Shakespearean conversation between the King of France and Bertram, Count of Rousselon, with the King speaking this part. When the term on us both is mentioned, it is about the king and Bertram's father. Now, as a previous pre-chapter quote, the two fusiliers was clearly about Hazel and Bigwig. The mentioning of both may simply be inclusive in the same way. If it were about the king and his father, it could be another cleverly coded reference to the Thraera, but alas, this is not the case and could therefore be a bit too much of a stretch. The overall meaning of this first quote seems clear. No matter what, the effects of time impact us all. The words, haggish age steal on, makes this obvious. The fact that this came from All's Well That Ends Well is perfect for this, and tells us before we start to read that, at the very least, Hazel will have a happy ending after a long life. The second quote is spoken by Alice in Through the Looking Glass. She's speaking to Kitty, and this is the longer form. Quote, you see Kitty, it must have been either me or the Red King. He was part of my dream, of course, but then I was a part of his dream too. Was it the Red King, Kitty? You were, you were his wife, my dear, so you ought to know. Oh, Kitty, do help me settle it. I'm sure your paw can wait. End quote. Nothing cryptic or hidden here. Through the Looking Glass is a well-known fantasy tale. When young, most of us learn this one, and many movies, books and TV shows make references to it, even in an episode of classic Star Trek in the 60s. It is widely referenced in popular culture. Again, nothing is hidden here, I think. This is just a great reference to a famous story to juxtapose Watership Down against. You could surmise that the meaning is simply something like, we've all been through this together. We have all gone through this adventure in one way, shape or form. So your story is a part of mine and vice versa. Because of how rabbits carry on their knowledge through storytelling, this quote seems to fit quite well. Adam speaks to us directly as readers in the opening sentence. It has a similar effect as when an actor breaks the fourth wall and speaks directly to the camera. This is not the first time that Adams does this, but he does it sparingly, so it stands out in a good way. The way he says that, quote, Fiverr brought them, end quote, to Watership Down gives real power to his vision. The wise Mr Lockley is referenced, and we learn that wild rabbits don't live very long. As an aside, and given this, until his demise, General Woundwort was quite successful within the species. Well, so was Hazel, as it turns out. We don't even get to know how long he lived, and the narrative is better for it. Might we venture venture a guess that the meaning of a tidy few here could be around five years? The ambiguity certainly implies hrare, or any number above four. He, quote, saw more young rabbits than he could remember, end quote. Given his yearling status at the beginning, you could guess that he's seen about four years' worth of rabbit births. He could also not clearly make out who was who when stories were told in the Warren, and we get a hint of this in the previous chapter from Vilthuril. Watership Down prospered, and so did the Warren that he envisioned that Groundsel started out leading. He was the, quote, first chief rabbit, end quote, and this implies that he is no more. Another hint about just how long-lived Hazel is. We also learn that Strawberry and Buckthorn joined this Warren between Watership Down and Ephrafa, this is quite heartwarming and interesting that it was two rabbits that did not make the trip to Ephrafa. We learn that Campion did agree to help populate this new warren, and that Bigwig's old mark captain from Ephrafa led that mission with success. We then hear about Woundwort. He's never seen again, and even high and low flying Kihar never sees him, and doesn't want to anyway. This is where we hear the last quote from Kihar in the book. It is good to know he came back. It is overwhelmingly likely that the farm dog killed Woundwort. However, because of his legendary status in Ephrafa, why should a former Ephrafan such as Groundsel not think that he's still out there? In Watership Down, he becomes a bogeyman of sorts. Adams does not tell us everything, and it's okay. We can learn a lot by just reading the epilogue. 
We know that as a warren, Watership Down did quite well. Hazel represents the entire warren, and it prospered, and even learning the outcome of just a couple of rabbits is just fine. The rabbits of Watership Down did take down Ephrapa, but it also managed to live on with different leadership, and the warren halfway in between that Hazel thought up was started and was also thriving. We don't know how long Fiverr lived, or Bigwig, or really anyone else. If Hazel had a mate at this point, she was not in the burrow, so I'd guess this probably means that he lived alone. That probably means that Heisenthay, who we learn in Tales from Watership Down, was his mate, has also left the world of the living some time before this. We're now with Hazel during a cool and windy March morning when a rabbit comes to see him. He's doing something that we who humans call catnapping, and those of us who are getting older are increasing fans of that practice. Hazel is ageing too, napping more, and he's also beginning to lose his sense of smell. Interestingly, Hazel had been dreaming about the smell of rain and elder bloom. Well, it is springtime after all, but rain does represent cleansing and renewal. Elder bloom can be medicinal, but that may be a stretch here. Hazel wakes to find a rabbit lying quietly beside him who seems to have shown himself in. The on-duty sentry should really have notified Hazel, however he does not really mind. Adams is telling us some things here. The chief rabbit of Watership Down has a sentry, just like the Threa did at Sandalford, and Hazel still acts with the kind of humility that endeared all of us to him so many chapters ago. Hazel does another humble thing by initiating the conversation. In the limited light of Hazel's burrow, we learn that there is a slight silver light coming from this rabbit's ears. Hazel, realising instantly the significance, wisely addresses this rabbit as Lord, and knows that it is Elachrera, as these are the ears he was gifted after his terrible visit to the Black Rabbit of Inlay. Hazel is invited to join Elachrera's Owlsler, and we know that this is a great honour and another indicator that Hazel stayed who he was throughout his long life. Elachrera coming to get you in person, and also may, pl may be playing the role of the Black Rabbit, must be a rare honour. The 1978 film seems to interpret this mysterious figure as being almost certainly the Black Rabbit, though with a kind of face. I have touched on this before. They pass by the sentry, who does not see Hazel's visitor. As they get above ground, other members of the Warren are out at morning Silflay. In one of the most moving moments in the book, Hazel realises that he'll no longer be needing his body, so he simply leaves it behind. Hazel was clearly dying, but death comes to him in an easy way. If this is the Black Rabbit, it is his gentler face. Departing his body, Hazel's soul feels powerful and an energy flows from him that even passes into the rabbits that are out feeding. Elohera tells him not to worry about the others and that they'll be fine, like thousands like them. He invites Hazel to come with him so he can show him what he means. The chapter and book closes with Hazel and Elachrera running away from the Warren on Watership Down through the woods. Primroses are beginning to bloom, and think this contrasts with the primroses that were ending at the very beginning of the book. Adams neatly used primroses as bookends. Quote, the primroses were over, end quote, at the beginning, marks the season at that point, but the fact that they were over is not an encouraging metaphor, as the Sandalford Warren soon will be as well. This ending where primroses are blooming, is a positive and upbeat contrast to Hazel's death. Much in the same way as Hazel leaving his body behind, only to feel a kind of life force once his soul has left that body. And so, the 1972 novel, Watership Down, ends. They went out past the young sentry, who paid the visitor no attention. The sun was shining, and in spite of the cold, there were a few bucks and does at Silflay, keeping out of the wind as they nibbled the shoots of spring grass. It seemed to Hazel that he would not be needing his body any more, so he left it lying on the edge of the ditch, but stopped for a moment to watch his rabbits, 
and to try to get used to the extraordinary feeling that strength and speed were flowing inexhaustibly out of him into their sleek young bodies and healthy senses. You didn't worry about them, said his companion. They'll be all right, and thousands like them. If you'll come along, I'll show you what I mean. He reached the top of the bank in a single powerful leap. Hazel followed, and together they slipped away, running easily down through the wood, where the first primroses were beginning to bloom. Mm -hmm.